Empire. Week one of the NFL season is finally upon us. And we're going to break it all down. Power rankings and predictions for the season. What's up, everybody? This is Mike Jones. Thanks for coming back for another episode of the Football Jones Podcast. You can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at by Mike Jones. And yes, after this wacky offseason and preseason, NFL 2020 Week 1 is here. Season's opening Thursday night in Kansas City. Houston Texans visiting the defending Super Bowl champs. I will be there at that game. And then, Sunday, the full slate, and then runs into Monday. It's going to be a really interesting year. It's really going to be just very intriguing to see how teams have handled their preparation, not having a traditional offseason and preseason, how they'll handle the the coronavirus, how will it impact their traveling plans, what they'll do if they have an outbreak. I don't know. There's a whole lot of questions and not a lot of answers. But we're along for the ride, going to chronicle it all. As I said, today going to give you predictions for the season and to help me out with it all, I have my buddy Nate Davis of USA Today Sports. He does weekly uh, power rankings and breakdowns. And so we're going to start off with our week one power rankings and then get into our season predictions. Nate and I always go back and forth behind the scenes. Um, and so I figured we'd bring it to life to the podcast. So here we go, diving in to our look at the 2020 NFL regular season. All right, and here, as promised, is my guy, Nate Davis. My guy, sometimes my thorn in my side, sometimes my buddy. We've got a, a crazy relationship here, but I do share a birthday with him, so he is kind of special to me. Nate Davis, USA Today Sports. How you doing, Nate? Only making my Mike Jones podcast debut. What, what took so long? Um, you, you just haven't been special enough to me. But, you know, I, um, I felt like as I saw your power rankings that it was time for one of our many arguments. And, um, you know, Nate and I always go back and forth debating different things and different points of view. And it's all in love. But, you know, I figured as I saw your power rankings, you know, it's good. But I just saw it was a classic. Mike and Nate argument brewing right here, and I figured we had to have it for a uh, a podcast. Well, Mike, I'm I'm happy to tell you why you're wrong and and and, and bring clarity to to your vision. So you know, feel feel free to uh, to bring up any any uh, problems that you have with them, and I'll I'll feel I'll feel free to cor- correct you. So, <laughs> all right, so uh, we're gonna get right into this here for for your week one power rankings, and um, I want to know if you can kind of just tell everybody your process and how you form these power rankings, because I know it had to be challenging this year, not being able to see these teams in any preseason limited training camp stuff, but, but how did you go into it this year, putting your power rankings together for week one? Yeah. I mean, as, as some people that follow USA today, know, I do them every week during the season. And then we kind of try to hit the high points in the off season, you know, after free agencies kind of petered out and after the draft and, you know, maybe something happens that, that, that warrants, you know, Andrew Luck retirement, you know, that, that can really shake things up, you know, for, for example. But uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Mike. I mean, mine, mine have not really changed a whole lot kind of since, since free agency, honestly. I mean, there hasn't really been a whole lot of major news. I mean, you get the Cam Newton signing, which you think is going to maybe make the Patriots a better team, and then all of a sudden all their defenders opt out or are gone to free agency, and that doesn't really – maybe make them as big a factor as you thought. And uh, so, so, yeah, I, I, I got to say my, my opinions on a lot of these teams haven't really changed a whole lot in the last few months. And I'm certainly looking forward to, a, you know, Thursday, Sunday, and Monday and finally getting a look at what some of these teams are actually going to look like between the lines. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it's been very difficult um, not being able to be at these places and, and see these teams on the field, talk to these guys as they're coming off the field, talk to coaches, getting the same insight that we normally would. And so I kind of, it feels weird that week one is here, but 
I'm, uh, I'm going to be there, Kansas City, against the Texans Thursday night, and really just hoping that we can have a safe and um, entertaining season, and we'll see how it all unfolds. And so to start off your power rankings, we both agree um, on your number one, that's your Chiefs, you know, and I mean that, I mean, I don't know how you could go any other way until somebody knocks them off. They are definitely, they didn't lose anybody. You know, they, they had a good draft. And so I agree with you there. You took care of Mahomes. Uh, you took care of Andy Reid. You took care of their GM. So they're still the powerhouse that they were when the season ended. Yeah, for, for sure. And I'm, I'm generally reluctant, you know, unless it's a situation like, like a John Elway retiring. I, I generally try to respect uh, the champs going into week one and, and start them off at number one, unless there's a really compelling reason not to. But, uh, I mean, you know, even if the Chiefs hadn't won Super Bowl 54, I think you'd have to have them right up in the top three pretty much in any scenario. And, and like you said, Mike, they're, they're pretty much bringing back, for the most part, you know, my, minus, you know, uh, a couple guys and none of them really major guys, they're, they're pretty much coming back intact. And, you know, there's, there's probably some people that are going to argue maybe they're even more dynamic, you know, with Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Um, in the backfield than Damian Williams. I mean, I think he's probably going to need, you know, one or two weeks to get accustomed to the NFL. And like you said earlier, the, these rookies haven't really been, uh, you know, gotten their, their welcome to the NFL moment yet that so many guys talk about getting, you know, in August in a preseason game. But, um, you know, I think, I think in a couple of weeks, and I, I think most people kind of view Clyde edwards helaire as the prohibitive offensive rookie of the year candidate. You know, it, it's possible this offense is going to be even more exciting than it was last year. Yeah, um, I, I do wonder a little bit about their defense because they're not going to have Bashad Breeland for a few weeks. Um, you know, they have a lot of people back, but that was that was still a question. You know, they got stronger as the postseason went along. You know, we'll see what happens there. But another year with Spags, I think that they will be strong. Um, I just – I don't know. I think any team, the first four weeks of the season, it might be – a little bit, you know, kind of disjointed and everything like that. No preseason, but we'll see. But, but again, I agree with you that these – That is another bigger point too, Mike, that maybe you agree on. But the Chiefs, you know, are, are one team. that they're, they're bringing back both their coordinators. You know, obviously Andy Reid's been there for a long time now, and Patrick Mahomes is very uh, familiar with this system. I mean, I, I'm really concerned. You know, we'll, we'll get into this later, I'm sure. But, you know, teams that are they're breaking in a new coach or new coordinators or new quarterback or they brought in a ton of free agents or a ton of rookies, I think those teams are really going to have, you know, the big learning curve at the season. And you just right. think that it would not be one of those teams and that the continuity is really going to help them on top of their talent. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's – that's. I mean, I think that it's going to be hard for a team to go out and no, come out of nowhere, you know, if they're starting all over the – you know, and – Again, the teams that are in place and were trending last year, I think they'll continue to trend. But I, I look at your number two, and I, I kind of don't feel like that's the right – you're two and three. I'm not okay. agreeing. Um, so now, you know, we're how we are always, um, just a little bit off. You got the Ravens number two and the Saints number three. Now, I, I like the Ravens. I was very high on them. I wasn't surprised they didn't make it to the Super Bowl just because, you know, the inexperience factor. I think they'll be very good this year. Um, but I don't have them as number two, and I don't have the Saints as number three. I've got the 49ers being my number two because they were right there and late in the season. They look like one of the most complete teams as well. And then I have the Ravens just a little bit lower. I've got them at number three there. Okay, and, I, and for perspective, I've got the 49ers at, at four, so not, not too far behind. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't remember how you felt, Mike, at the end of last season. I mean, clearly going into the playoffs last year, I think we probably could all agree the Ravens were the best team. You know, 14-2 and two set, set the record for rushing yards in a season and just looked pretty unstoppable going into the playoffs. Had that huge winning streak, um, you know, going into their bye week. Uh, I, I covered the game that they lost to, to the Titans and shocking how, how easily they went down. And Lamar Jackson's kind of admitted since that, that maybe they were looking past them. You know, maybe they were, they were looking ahead to the Chiefs in the championship game and, and maybe beyond. But um, I, I just – I love the talent here. Uh, again, we, we're talking about continuity. And obviously, you know, John Harbaugh has been there since 2008. And this is always one of the strongest teams in the league almost every year. And with Lamar coming off the MVP season. And, and you know, and I wonder, Mike, with the way this offseason has gone, have teams, you know, have, have they really had a sufficient um, forum to figure out a way to, to stop this offense, which really was, was unstoppable in many ways? 
yeah. last year. And, and so, so often teams go into an off season and then they're, they're looking for a way to shut down that, that, that top team. I don't know if they're going to be able to figure that out for the Ravens. And then you just kind of talk about, uh, you know, to add JK Dobbins to that backfield with Mark Ingram uh, and, and Lamar, of course, you know, you would think that Lamar, is going to be a better passer this year than he was last year. And he's talked that that's kind of been one of his main objectives is, is to use his, his weapons in the receiving core, maybe a little more. He's been reliant on Mark Andrews, obviously. Uh, and then I love the addition of, of Calais Campbell and first round linebacker, Patrick Queen to the defense. And then the defense really let them down in the playoffs. You know, we all, we all remember Derek Henry trucking over Earl Thomas there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a guy like Calais will really do them well. And, and, and I really think that in some ways, maybe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously kind of foreseeing a Chiefs, maybe Ravens AFC championship game down the line. And I think the AFC is a lot more top heavy than the NFC. But I, 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 think, I just think these, these are the two best teams in football right now. I, I feel like they have the potential to be. I really I'm wondering what Lamar is going to do for an encore act. I want mm-hmm. him. I hope he, he just stays within himself and he continues to play his way. I, I don't want him to feel like, OK, I really got to become this. I mean, he was a good passer. He was effective mm-hmm. passer, but I don't want him to start trying to do too much uh, because he feels like, okay, now the next step is for me to, um, cause sometimes there's pressure uh, like that we've seen with, with quarterbacks who scramble and that's a big part of their game. Then they feel the pressure to expand it even more. Uh, I think keep doing what you're doing. Obviously you work on your passing game, but until they take away your, your legs, keep on using them. And I'm just curious to see what defenses throw at him now that they've had a year because those defense coordinators, even though they weren't on the field with their OTAs and everything, they were still in the lab uh, studying. And those guys are, they are really smart. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see, but I do agree with you about their defense, the addition of Campbell. Um, I don't really think that Earl Thomas is a huge loss. Um, I agree. I agree. That is, I guess, addition by subtraction. I, I saw, I don't know how many times last year I saw him pull up, when there was a breakaway run because, you know, it was a business decision. Those, you know, 30 something year old legs and hamstrings uh, didn't have the bursts that they had before. And so I'm not worried about them losing him, but I think that was great that they added another piece um, front with a dominant guy like Campbell. Um, And you make an interesting point, Mike. I mean, you, you personally saw, you know, when RG three wanted to be more of a passer than a runner in his second year, of course he was coming off. The injury, you know, I, I know people have that debate about, you know, quote unquote running quarterbacks, but I think there is that, that other, you know, thought process that sometimes it's easier to protect, protect yourself when, when you're on the run than maybe than if you're uh, in the pocket. And I, and I think you're right. Maybe, maybe I hope Lamar doesn't overthink this and, and wants to just become a passer uh, and, and wants to run less just because he thinks that that's what he should do for his development when he's so scary, you know, playing the game the way he did last year. Yeah. And losing Marshall Yonda up front. Um, yeah. You right. know, really reliable interior lineman there. So um, that that's, you hope that they've got that short up for him, but we'll see. Um, the Saints, man, I, I, I understand why you're putting them there, but at the same time, I feel like with Drew Brees contemplating retirement and the way that they have not taken leaps forward, um, not been able to get over that hump, uh, last year, they lost at home in the playoffs to the Vikings. I feel like they might take another step backwards here. If you're starting to think about retirement, you probably should retire. And just, again, not being able to get over the hump. They've got the distraction of Kamara, although it sounds like they're trying to get something done. I just don't know. I don't know if they're going to be this elite. I think they'll be good but I don't know if they're number three overall good. Why did you feel like they were that? Yeah, it's fair. And then and just a spoiler alert that the Saints and the Ravens are, are my Super Bowl 55 picks. So that's probably part of the reason. I just throw that all out. And- yeah, part of the reason I got them so high. And, you know, uh, but yeah, and, and again, you know, the Saints, I was, I was there two years ago, you know, when, when they lost, when they quote unquote lost, you know, in the, in the NFC championship game to the Rams and, yeah. I thought they were going to get over it last year, and they had another great season. But like you said, they they, they uh, hit the speed bump and lost to Kirk Cousins, of, of all people, and the Vikings at home. But I, I just think this this may be the best roster, in my opinion, top to bottom in the league. You, you mentioned Alvin Kamara, who played, you know, by his own estimation, 75% most, most of last year. And now you know, he's back up, up to full speed, you know, minus the back injection and all that recently. But uh, you know, you've added Emmanuel Sanders, which should take some pressure off, off Mike Thomas. You know, I think Jared Cook 
was, was a real great weapon for them down the stretch last year, but he took some a while to get going off the injury last year. Uh, and, and then, you know, we mentioned Calais Campbell with the Ravens. I feel like they've added a dog themselves in Malcolm Jenkins, um, who, who was there for their first Super Bowl run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think he's probably the kind of guy that that defense needs, you know, him in the back, Cam Jordan in the front, um, some other pretty underrated players they've got on that side of the ball with Lattimore, Demario Davis, you know, you go down the line. Um, and then, it, again, it gets back to continuity, Mike, and, and no team, I think, has more of it when you talk about Sean Payton and Drew Brees being together since 06. You know, the coordinators have been there for, for many years. And this team felt so good about themselves that they, they skipped the offseason, right? They, they, they told their guys, stay home, stay safe. You know, we'll see you in August. Um, I, I think if they stay healthy, I, I don't know. I mean, the NFC, you could, you could put six or seven teams in the bag and pick one out and, and call them your Super Bowl favorite. But um, for me, there's just, there's just too much talent here. And I, I guess the big question I got about the Saints is, are they going to have the home field advantage they're used to right. um, without their fans? And that, that goes for a lot of teams. I mean, you can say it about Seattle or Kansas City or whomever, but to me that's going to be one of the big wild cards is, you know, you always expect the Saints to, to go win seven or eight games at home. You know, and will those guys be flat for a couple of those games, you know, with, without the fans and particularly coming out of the shoot against Tom Brady and the Bucks. Support for this podcast comes from CDW and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. At CDW, we get modern servers need to be flexi- flexible, scalable, and predictable. I predicted you'd say that. <clears throat> okay, what will I say next? Probably something about server security. Impressive and freaky. CDW can implement secure Hewlett Packard Enterprise Gen 10 servers that improve speed and performance while reducing costs. While co- reducing costs. See predictable. IT orchestration by CDW. People who get it. I predict a web address. CDW.com slash HPE. I'm in your mind, man. Okay, so number four, you have the 49ers. I've got them, like I said, up higher. Um, I feel like that's another one with continuity. Um, as they continue to grow, as Jimmy Garoppolo continues to feel comfortable um, in that system, I, I just feel like having Trent Williams to add to that offense is going to be huge. Um, I think Nick Bosa on, you know, another year of development, uh, they, they continue to just, you know, they load up on young talent. They get rid of, you know, older talent. I, I like this team, and I feel like they're going to – now, I don't have them making it to the Super Bowl, but I just feel like they're one of the – they're not going to be a Rams where they flashed and then just fell apart. Mm-hmm. I think that they are going to continue to, to grow. Well, yeah, I kind of look at this team, and like, like you, I love the Trent Williams edition. And, you know, uh, uh, that's quite a compliment because Joe Staley was, was no stiff over there at left tackle, but I still think that Trent probably represents an upgrade there. Um, but I guess on the other side of the coin, you know, you lose Emmanuel Sanders, who we, we talked about to the Saints. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think the divorce Buckner loss, you know, I know they, they drafted Kinlaw, they drafted Ayuk to kind of replace those guys. But you look at those three positions, you know, left tackle, receiver uh, and defensive tackle. And, and I, I, w- I would say overall for them, maybe net loss at those positions um, as much as I like the trend addition. Now, now you mentioned Jimmy, I think, you know, he's now two years out from the knee injury and I would think he'd be more comfortable uh, than he was last year. Um, but I kind of wonder what, what's he working with downfield with, with uh, Ayuk and Debo and, and so many young, young receivers. Um, and, and then, you know, just just coming off a disappointing Super Bowl, we see the hangover effect so often. I, I agree with you. I don't think this is a ram situation, um, but they're they're not going to sneak up on anybody this year either. And, and I just kind of think that maybe uh, you know I, I don't see them getting all the way back. Uh, but I, I do think it comes down to 49ers and Saints, in my opinion, in the NFC. I, I feel like okay, they still have George Kittle. If Jordan Reed can stay healthy, that's I mean the two of those. <laughs> Loves his tight ends. That's a big if about Jordan Reed, I know. Maybe having basically almost all of the year off last year has helped him. Um, Samuel, I mean, I've seen Kyle Shanahan scheme up Pierre Garçon to have a hundred and something catches, you know, when they had nobody else. And you always knew that he was going to get the ball. So I still feel like their weapons are better, um, are, are adequate, and that they can get a lot out of them. It's a really creative and innovative offensive staff, not just Kyle, but the other guys he's working with. So that's why I kind of feel like, yeah, they had some losses, but, you know, talking to Trent, talking to defensive guys and some other people on their staff just about 
what his addition and his athleticism is enabling them to do. I just, I just feel good about them. Well, bummer we didn't get to see those Trent Williams, Nick Bosa battles in camp. I bet that yeah. would Seriously, agree with you. Okay, number five, you have the Titans. Um, I, I have the Seahawks above them. Uh, awesome. You know, I, as much as I like the 49ers, the Seahawks were really close, and they've, got, they've made additions on their defense. I really feel like the Seahawks are going to overtake the 49ers, win that division. I actually have them making it to the Super Bowl. Um, you have the Seattle Seahawks quite a bit further down, though. Yeah, I mean, I will say, admittedly, I don't, I don't feel I, I kind of feel like once I get to t- past that top four, a lot of these teams, you know, obviously, they're listed five to twelve or whatever, but I don't think that they're that far apart. That being said, I, I am not. I, I love covering the Seahawks, and I love that locker room, and, and I, I love the you know the competitive DNA within that franchise, but. I don't love them. And I think I've got them going nine and seven this year and finishing second again to the Niners. But um, I really felt like they did it so much with smoke and mirrors last year, Mike. I mean, they, they went 11 and five, but they outscored their opponents on the season by seven points. Uh, like it was so many nip and tuck games. And, and I feel like, you know, again, once again, you know, yeah, great. They had, they had Jamal Adams. Right. We'll see how well that they utilize him, but and I realized that Clowney was not a big sack guy for them last year, but you really wonder, I wonder, you know, where, where is the pass rush coming from for this defense that, that finished, I think, 24th or 25th overall last year? Uh, and, and then once again, and, and I guess to your point, Mike, I guess we say this every year about the offensive line, you know, it looks bad. And every year Russell Wilson, you know, overcomes that. But at, at some point, you know, and as Russell gets 30, is, is it going to let him down? Is, is he going to get exposed? Um, I, I just kind of wonder really about this team uh, in the trenches on both sides of the ball. Okay, that's fair. Um, I, I guess I just have a lot of confidence in I feel like that when we're talking about continuity and you could see that they were really putting it together down the stretch of last season. And I just I feel like maybe this year they kind of surge for it a little bit more. But and this team always plays well late. They're always a December team. But you know, again, yeah, they, they caught them they, either. You're, you know, that that twelfth man. You, it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact that has on some of these teams um, that are used to normally having that. And I think the receivers will be better. I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting seeing DK Metcalf. You know, in year two and, and Lockett. I think I think they're kind of underrated. Of course, there's that whole thing out there. Do you, do you let Russ cook? And that's what the Seahawks fans want to see. You know, let him let him throw before the fourth quarter. I think that gets back to the offensive line and, and who they want to be, which is a running physical team. You know, you got Chris Carson coming off the injury. I guess he's going to be okay. You had Carlos Hyde, but I don't know, man. I just, I just hope that they got enough, enough effective bodies there on, on both lines. Gotcha. Okay. So back to your top five, you have the Titans there. Um, adding Clowney is definitely a big help for them. You know, they re-sign uh, Tannehill, they re-sign Henry, but I don't know why. I still can't totally believe in Tannehill. Yeah. Um, again, I, 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 can't, I can't say you're wrong. You know, can he do it again in the second year now that the teams have seen him in that system? Um, you know, how, how much can De- – Derrick Henry is, is a great two-down back, but um, it seems like they're going to be asking him to do more as a receiver this year. I'm not sure that's the best way to use him. Um, you know, I, I did love the addition of Clowney, and I moved the Titans up to five over the Steelers kind of late in the game here because Clowney had his best seasons when he and Mike Vrabel were together mm-hmm. in Houston. So I think, I think he's going to be a more effective player probably in, in Nashville than he was in Seattle. But um, I, I'm torn in this division, Mike. I mean, I, I really kind of want to put the Colts, you know, as, as the AFC South champs. Um, and I know Phillip Rivers, you know, knows, knows Frank Reich and Nick Sirianni from, from their time together in San Diego. Uh, and I, I did mean San Diego because that's when they, when they uh, were all, all together, but, Again, how, how quickly is that team going to gonna get ramp, ramp on to, to, to the, uh, the highway and, and Rivers working with so many new teammates, whereas the Titans, you know, again, come back pretty intact and obviously finish so strong. So I'm, I'm, I'm rolling with them with the benefit of the doubt for right now. Yeah, and I mean, when you look at the rest of their division, I'm, I'm worried for the Texans because you're losing Hopkins. And I know, yes, they say that they've added better speed across the top, um, across the board. Um, and so maybe it'll help. I still don't love their offensive line outside of Tunsil. I'm not confident mm-hmm. about 
their ability to protect Watson. There's a lot that's going to be on him. So I don't see, you know, they, they might have some struggles. Uh, and I, I'm never very confident in what Bill O'Brien does outside of paying Deshaun Watson for the long term. Um, and I don't feel good about Phillip Rivers in that Colts team. He didn't look great last year. And another year, new surroundings. I know he's seen it all. I just don't have a whole lot of confidence. So I guess I agree with you. You know, the Titans are the ones to win that division because obviously Jaguars are a non-factor. I would love to see, you know, it's a great story if Phillip Rivers can go from the Chargers and find a new home and really put them back winning. But I, I don't know about him. And I feel like I almost wouldn't be surprised if we wind up seeing Jacoby Brissett take his job back if they're losing close games because that arm strength, that accuracy is not what it was for Rivers. And they're trying to win if – I just – I don't feel great about them. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, um, you, you know, but I think if they have to go back to Joe, Jacoby Brissett, I think they're probably sunk because, I mean, they were they were a 500 team with him last year, which is obviously why they made the move for Rivers in the first place. Um, but I, th- I think the point you're driving at, Mike, is are you getting 2018 Phillip Rivers or 2019 Phillip Rivers? And, of course, the Chargers were, were 12 and 14 two years ago. You know, and Frank Reich, you know, has said that the arm is fine, you know, and I feel like a lot of his Chargers teammates last year, I've heard Thomas Davis say it, uh, Keenan Allen and others. I mean, everything I've heard from guys that played with him last year are that Phillip was fine. Uh, I just think that he got put into a lot of bad positions by, by the defense. And, and like, you know, he said it, you know, like, who, who cares if I throw a pick if I'm trying to win a game because we're down 10 points with four, with four minutes to go. And I, I think he tried to force the issue a lot last year. And I think the numbers – kind of came out looking worse than probably what they really were. Um, and, and I don't think they're going to ask him to throw that much in Indianapolis. Uh, I mean, they don't have the – I mean, T.Y. T. Hilton, how long is, is, is he going to stay healthy you know, yeah, on, their, right. on a rookie receiver? But what, what the difference I love here is, is when did Phillip Rivers ever have an offensive line with the Chargers like the one he's going to have now? And I think you're going to see a lot of Jonathan Taylor and a lot of uh, Marlon Mack. Uh, but, I mean, again, I think the big thing here, too, is, is the defense. And it's been up and coming, and I thought the DeForest-Buckner trade was a huge one for them. Um, and I just like the way that Chris Ballard has built this team and, and to selectively bring in Phillip as kind of the cherry on top. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a playoff team, whether it's as ASC South champs or, or as a wild card. But I'm, I'm, I'm buying 2018 Phillip Rivers showing up here. You, you make a good argument there. Live sports are canceled, but the world of wrestling is holding strong. Can we talk about that? Yes, please. Every week we're talking about all things wrestling on our podcast, Kind of Fun. I'm Ben, a super fan who knows all the angles. And I'm Katie, a wrestling insider and filmmaker documenting the world behind the ropes. And no matter what the world of sports looks like, there's always something new happening in the squared circle. From AEW to New Japan to the Indies and beyond, we've got all the latest wrestling gossip and news. Listen to Kind of Fun free only on Spotify. Now I want to hear your argument for the Bucks. Um, I, I feel like, I mean, the table's set. I'm not saying they're going to win another Super Bowl. I, like I said, I have the, uh, well, I, did I say it? I have the Chiefs and the, uh, the Seahawks with the Chiefs winning it. But I still think that the Bucks are going to wind up winning that division. Um, they got Tom Brady. They got all the running backs that any team could want. They've got great wide receivers. They got tight ends. Um, they've got a pretty decent defense. What do you like about them? You have them eighth. Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, they, they, they've got the talent. Um, I guess my question is, you know, as, as great as Tom Brady is, you know, he hasn't he hasn't played a game with these guys. Right. Um, and and we, we've kind of seen for years where the Patriots would kind of treat September as preseason and, 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 and get the bugs out. I'm not saying the Bucks would approach it that way, but I think he's, he's got to play games with these guys, get comfortable with them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they, they've got the Bucks out of the shoot. They've, they've got the Chargers, I think, in September. They, they've, got, they've got a pretty tough opening four games, and I kind of see them going two and two uh, in that area. Um, but, I mean, you know, Gronk has got to get back up, up to speed and get back in a game. So I, I think there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve, plus the fact that, you know, Tom Brady's going to have to kind of do things that Bruce Arians wants and Bruce Arians is going to kind of have to, uh, um, you know, maybe maybe dial down the way he wants to attack downfield to accommodate what Tom Brady is best at. So I just think that there's going to be a bit of a a learning curve for this team when you bring in a 42 year old quarterback, a 43 year old quarterback who's only played in one system his entire career. Um, The thing I do like about this team though, that people don't talk about enough, I think, 
uh, is, is the defense. Um, you know, the, the Bucks finished, you know, lo low last year in, in scoring, but I think people forget that Jameis Winston threw 40 touchdowns last year, uh, and seven of those, Mike, were, were to the other team. But, but that all counts against their defensive scoring. Um, but, I mean, when you got JPP kind of going through a career renaissance and Shaq Barrett leading the league in sacks and Dominick and Sue, so some, some, actually some pretty good young corners that people don't talk about, uh, and then Levante David, uh, you know, in the linebacking core, and then, you know, the uh, De De Devin White, too, you know, the, the first-round pick last year entering year two. I think his defense could be could be really good. Um, and with Tom Brady managing the football, obviously, better than Jameis did, we all assume that that will happen. I think this is going to be a much better team, you know, even even if it maybe conceivably doesn't score as well as it did last year. I don't think they're going to have to. And, and I feel like you call a play, but you trust Tom Brady with his knowledge and everything and what he knows of defenses – you know, you give him the green light to to call as many audibles as he wants. I feel like it's going to be more suggestions, um, and he's going to have a great input. So I don't feel like they're going to struggle a whole lot as far as getting on the same page as their offense. I feel like the way he works so tirelessly in the off season, even violating you know coach. <laughs> yeah. And now I feel like they're you know they'll be pretty good. But yeah, there's always some gelling time. On to number nine, you have the Packers there. Um, you know, I don't know why I really hated what they did this offseason, but I have them at number eight. So I'm right in that neighborhood with you. And I think that they win their division, even though that was I just I didn't get their draft jumping up to get, you know, a quarterback of the future instead of a wide receiver. Uh, but I just feel like having got that quarterback of the future, I feel like Aaron Rodgers is going to have a massive chip on his shoulder. I feel like that was year one. And now year two, he's more comfortable in this system. The defense is, you know, is clicking. Um, you know, they've got young pass rushers. And I feel like they're going to be pretty good. Um, and so I've got them in my top ten as well. Yeah, Mike, I hope, I hope your listeners aren't disappointed because I feel like aside from the Seahawks, we're not really arguing too much here yet. Because, uh, but, but, yeah, I, I've got them winning the North again, but, but I'm not real confident in them. I mean, they, they win 13 games last year. I've got them more in the 9 and 7 range this year. Uh, I totally agree with you that I, I didn't understand, you know, if, if you've got a quarterback on the back end of his career, why, but, but clearly still playing at a very high level, why you don't do more to help him out uh, as opposed to playing for the future. You know, and everyone talks about the Jordan Love thing, but I didn't really get drafting A.J. Dillon, the running back, who's a classic downhill runner, you know, in the second round, because he's not a guy you're going to throw to either. So, so it, it is kind of hard to see what the bigger picture is, other than they're, they're just kind of laying the groundwork for whatever is after Aaron Rodgers. But, yeah, so I, I kind of like them to win the North by default. I think people do forget that Devontae asked quite a bit last year, so having him back healthy should help, but you still kind of wonder – is, is, is Alan Lazard really a legit number two guy? Are they going to get anything out of their tight ends this year? I agree that the defense is, is underrated and very good, but um, I think I think the Packers, Vikings, and Lions are all a lot closer in that division than people realize with, with not enough people talking about Detroit. I just can never – I can never feel good about Detroit. But is this now year three for Matt Patricia that we're going into? And I just – nothing instills confidence um, for me – with that team there. Um, and I feel like the Vikings, I know that they added more to their defense. I think they're going to miss Stefan Diggs more than they um, anticipate. Adam Thielen did have some good games where Diggs was not playing, but I think that now not having him, teams are going to key on Thielen a lot more. I know they added speed um, to the draft, but I, I feel like I listed them as my disappointing team. Um, I have them missing, um, narrowly missing the playoffs, not winning their division at all. Yeah, same. I mean, so people know I've got the Packers winning nine games, winning the division. I got the Vikings winning eight, missing the playoffs. The Lions winning seven, missing the playoffs. Um, the, the thing that actually scares me about the Vikings is I, I, I want to say they're top three corners left in free agency. Um, so I, I did love the Ngakwe move because I think between Ngakwe and Daniel Hunter, um, the, the, you, you maybe you have the pass rush that can compensate for a very young group of corners, but but can it? I mean, how well is that going to hold up? And I think great great point on Diggs. Uh, but I love the Lions. I mean, they they were they were tough last year. You know, they almost beat Kansas City. Uh, they beat the Chargers early in the season. They they, they were basically a five hundred team until Matthew Stafford got hurt, and then they went they went zero and eight without him. Um, right, but they, that's just I think that that's all they are is like a five hundred team. 
Maybe, but I feel like a 500 team may be going in the right direction. You know, I'm curious, like, how importing all these, uh, you know, ex expatriate guys like, uh, like uh, you know, Jamie Collins and whatnot and others, I think Danny Shelton, does that help the defense, you know, get better? Um, but they just have so many underrated players, you know, Galladay being another one. You know, what, what does DeAndre Swift, what does Adrian Peterson, you know, add to the mix? I mean, other than maybe a guy that kind of shows – you know, Matt Patricia shows this, this is how you need to work to, to be uh, an elite player. But, I mean, it, it's make or break for Matt Patricia. I mean, if, if they're not going to win seven or eight games, like, he's not going to be there uh, in 2021. And not for nothing, Mike, but, I mean, I, I was shocked, too, that, that the Lions were the team that, that were the first ones to come out and, and cancel practice because of Jacob Blake. And it really seemed like, you know, those guys were united and galvanized, and all of a sudden they were proud to be Detroit Lions. True. Uh, and we're all singing the praises of Matt Patricia, which I hadn't really heard up to this point. Um, I, I'm really curious if that, if that, you know, you, you don't want to point to that as a between the lines thing, but I, I kind of wonder if these guys have found something and, and maybe are, are, are maybe more united and, and tight than, than they have been under him before. You never know. Um, I guess, I mean, that, that makes a good, I mean, you make a good point. And, you know, again, it's a weird off season. There's going to be teams that do well that we weren't expecting. There's going to be teams that, you know, maybe don't do as well as we thought and maybe the, the the unity of that locker room can help them I just for some reason I just still you know I can't believe in them um so that's that's your top 10 right there you have the page well, I, I got the I got the bills at 10 I don't have the Vikings oh, that's, right. Oh, we, that's right that's right we, I, I missed I was talking about our top 10 you know I want to say that the bills will will build on last year but I just I can't believe on that I can't believe in them either um, because they just have never done it back to back, and you would think, yeah, the door's open because Tom Brady's gone. But I, I think the Patriots are going to be good again this year. Yeah, I know that they had a lot of guys opt out, but they always plug and play. They always have young guys that are going to do well. Cam Newton's got a massive chip on his shoulder. Bill Belichick's got a massive chip on his shoulder. I think that they win their division again. Really? Yeah, I really feel like this is a match made in heaven here. Um, again, I know that they lost a lot of help on defense. But I think that they're going to be more creative on offense than what we've seen. Um, they've got young receivers who have been growing into their roles. I, I just – I feel like Bill Belichick is too proud to tank for Trevor. And Cam Newton is looking at these other quarterbacks getting paid. And he's like, look, if I take care of business this year and I am in a great situation and a great organization, I think this team really does well. And so I've got them winning their division again. Mike, before you go to your Google machine, how many uh, how many uh, guys in the Patriots front seven can you name? I told you that they always plug and play young guys. It's okay. Well, I, I, I think that the defensive, the, the guys they lost in free agency and the guys that they lost in the opt-outs, I mean, and Hightower and Chung were, were big losses. I mean, those, those, are, those are guys that represent defensive continuity. I, I really think that's good the story of this team because, I mean, this was a team built on defense last year, uh, and it's just been stripped on that side of the ball. But, you know, even if you want to buy into the Cam Newton thing, and I think it's fair, uh, and he's going to bring a dimension that Tom Brady doesn't. But, I mean, the thing that we kept talking about last year is that, you know, Tom Brady doesn't really have the weapons around him. Well, they're the same guys that are going to be around Cam Newton. And I realize maybe, maybe Cam bringing the running dimension makes Sony Michelle or Julian Edelman or Nikhil Harry a little more effective because you got to maybe commit another guy to the box to watch Cam. But, I mean, this is basically the same offense – Plus Cam, minus the opt-out, you know, with Marcus Cannon on the line. I, I just and, – and, I mean, the, the thing that makes me have him, like, on the fringe of the wild card is Bill Belichick. But I kind of wonder at what point can even Bill Belichick salvage his team. Yeah, but, I mean, I think that – okay, look, Harry is another year older. You, you could tell he was still at times trying to learn. Um, I just feel like, you know, healthy Edelman – Sonny Michelle, they have like just a stable of rotating backs and everything. Again, Bill, I, I really feel like he sees this as a challenge. Look, okay, not only am I going to prove that I can win without Tom Brady, I, I can still pull out all the stops and punch the right buttons, even though I've had key guys opt out here. And just, I think also a lot of it has to do, and look, I don't have them making a deep playoff run, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I don't believe the Bills know how to win consistently and the Dolphins are still building. It's going to be a developmental year for, um, uh, for, for Tua. And your Jets are just your <laughs> Jets. What about my Jets? They're, they're your Jets. That's, like, all you have to say about them. They're the Jets. And so who else, like, 
the, the Patriots have this division. Well, Mike, I will tell you that I, I, I dropped my, my Jets uh, from, from a five-win team to, to a three-win team, you know, post uh, the losses of C.J. Mosley and Jamal Adams. So I'm not going to argue with you there. Um, you know, hitting back on the Patriots real quick, you know, I, I do wonder, you know, what, what kind of players, for instance, are Julian Edelman and James White really without Tom Brady, you know, without you know, that chemistry with Cam? Cam's not the same kind of quarterback. You know, are, are, they, are they really going to be as viable weapons, you know, in this new environment? You know, I, I guess we'll see. I've got the Bills winning 10 games. Their, their, their schedule, I feel, is really favorable um, first half of the season. But th- this is my, you know, I, I went to school with, uh, with Sean McDermott. I, I know the kind of guy he is. I, I love the way that they've built the, the culture of that team. You know, it's been, it's been draft and develop. They've been selective in free agency. So, and, and really, they, they, they should have won, won the playoff game at, at Houston last year. Um, I, I just like them continuing to build. And, I mean, you say they've never done it back-to-back, but – I mean, the Bills hadn't made the playoffs like like in, since 1999 before Sean McDermott showed up, and now they've been twice in three years. And and I mean, I think the big question there is is can Josh Allen take a step forward? But I, I, man, I, I just think that they're turning into a team kind of like, like the way the Steelers used to be, Mike. Where I, I don't think you want to. I, I think you're still feeling the Bills a week after. I mean, I think they're real physical on both sides of the ball. I, I like the young runners there, and Devin Singletary and rookie Zach Moss. You know, you mentioned Stephon Diggs being a big loss for the Vikings. I mean, I think he's a nice pickup for, for this team, particularly when, you you know, you mix him in with John Brown or Cole Beasley. I mean, those are three very distinct receivers that bring different things to the table. I mean, part of me likes the Bills just because I think the Patriots have, have taken so many steps back. But but I, I do like what they're building in Buffalo. All right. Well, we will let you – we will let it play out. Um, we are at our time here. Everybody go on USA Today Sports. Check out the rest of Nate's – power rankings here and um we're gonna have to do this again we'll revisit this after four weeks and see how this thing is playing out i was just gonna say mike you you, you can apologize to me in october if you don't want until december but you know we'll we'll see how this goes but don't don't feel like you have to wait till week 17 to say man nate you know you, you were right and i was wrong all right sounds good we will see all right nate well thank you so much man i hope you have a great day and i will talk to you soon good luck in KC, buddy thank you It'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. Again, it's very hard to get a feel for just where teams stand because we haven't been able to see them. But we're going off of what we know from last year, what little bits and pieces we know from talking to people, from reports, and what things appear to be. But it's going to be a wild ride. Maybe we will see some teams come out of nowhere. Maybe we'll see some teams really hit a wall. I'm curious about the Saints. They're, you know, they're off season. Like Nate said, they basically were just like, hey, stay home. We're good. You know, before it was even required of everybody. And I don't know. Has that been helpful? Will it be hurtful? And just age. All of these quarterbacks that are 40 years or older, or even late 30s, Father Time creeps up at some point. I still think Tom Brady's got the magic. He'll figure out a way. But the other guys, I don't know. So we'll see. But anyway, hope you have a great day. Thanks again for listening. Again, read it all at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at by Mike Jones. Take this podcast. Share it with your friends. Go on there. Give me a rating and review. And I will talk to you again next week.